Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Thomas Taco. He's professor of metaphysics of science at the University of Bristol. He specializes in contemporary analytic metaphysics with an emphasis on methodological and epistemic issues, namely meta metaphysics. And today we're going to talk about exactly that, meta metaphysics, metaphysics, and some other related topics. So, uh, Thomas, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thanks very much, Ricardo. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So, on the show, I've already had interviews on physics, on metaphysics, but is the first this is the first one on meta metaphysics. So I guess that we'll we'll have to I, I mean walk a few small steps here into what it is. But broadly speaking, what is meta metaphysics? How does it relate to metaphysics, and what sorts of questions does it deal with exactly? Yeah, good. Um, I suppose it makes sense to say just a few words about what I think metaphysics is uh, okay. before we get to the metaphysic, meta metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So um, I take a broadly Aristotelian view of uh, of metaphysics uh, as uh, be a study of being uh, qua being or being in itself. So uh, something like um, the first philosophy, uh, as Aristotle would have put it, and. Uh, uh, that would include uh, quite a broad range of topics, obviously, things like uh, ontological categories and, and the relations between them. Uh, but, uh, you know, the whole spread of the usual topics in metaphysics would, would fall under uh, fall under that. And uh, if we get to meta-metaphysics, well, uh, the idea is just that there is something that it is like to do metaphysics or like to study metaphysics. And uh, meta-metaphysics would, would ask that question, what it is to do metaphysics. So how do we get to knowledge or information about those fundamental questions of philosophy that we study in metaphysics? Um, and that could take a, a number of different shapes. So we could, we could look at uh, the epistemology of metaphysics. Uh, that, would, that would be part of meta-metaphysics, as I understand it. Or the methodology of metaphysics, more broadly speaking. So... For instance, how does metaphysics relate to science, natural science? How does it relate to uh, the a priori, a posteriori distinction? Again, back to epistemic issues. Um, how does it deal with things like uh, modality? So study of possibility and necessity. Are metaphysical truths necessary in some sense? Uh, and if so, in what sense? Um, and uh, broadly speaking, I suppose meta metaphysics could also be uh, seen to study the role of metaphysics in philosophy. So how does met metaphysics relate to other philosophical areas of inquiry? Is there something especially problematic or difficult about metaphysics, given that it claims to study uh, philosophy in this sort of broader sense? Or if it's first philosophy, as Aristotle put it, what does that mean exactly for uh, for its role in, in philosophy? So that would be a very sort of rough uh, list of topics that we could study in metaphysics, as I see it. Okay, so several different uh topics that you mentioned there that I would like to ask you a little bit more about just to clarify things here. So when you say that meta metaphysics is also interested in how in how metaphysics relates to other areas in philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, so it also asks question about uh, questions about how, for example, it relates to things like epistemology and perhaps other areas of philosophy. But I would imagine that epistemology would be a big one here, right? I mean, because uh, it's one thing to understand what reality is, to put it in simple terms, of, or what reality is composed of, stuff like that. But another mm -hmm. thing is for us to really understand to what extent we as humans can acquire knowledge about it. And if we are acquiring, acquiring knowledge about reality, what are we inquiring about exactly? Right. I mean, is that right or, or? Yeah, no, that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, I I often think of um, the relationship between metaphysics and epistemology as being um, two sides of the same coin, really, uh, because mm -hmm. you can't really uh, do metaphysics if you don't have some view about how, what it is that you're uh, trying to know know about and and how you are you are going about uh, that that inquiry, and and similarly. 
you can't really do ep epistemology if you don't have a target for for that mm -hmm. uh, that uh, knowledge that you are you are seeking. So um, so I do think that they uh, they are very closely related in in that sense. Um, and uh, I suppose I mean maybe it would be useful to give a give an example. So mm -hmm. so um, think about. Um, uh, Think about the categorical structure of, of reality that we supposedly study study in metaphysics. Now, uh, if you think that that categorical structure of reality is something that is uh, just made up by by people, it's mind mm -hmm. dependent in some sense, or dependent on our concepts or conceptualizations of reality, then it seems that the epistemic question has to focus on the human mind. Uh, I suppose this might be a Kantian answer to that question. You know, yeah. the, the categories are in the mind and we have to study the human mind. Now, maybe there's something out, outside the human mind that these uh, uh, categories of the mind are related to, but that might be um, uh, beyond our uh, beyond our reach in, in terms of, uh, of, of our knowledge of the world. Or if you think that those categories of reality are mind independent, then obviously mm -hmm. you must you must tell us something about how you intend to get to those categories, perhaps involving the natural sciences or some sort of interplay between metaphysics and the sciences. Mm -hmm. And I guess that we also have to keep in mind, and this is very important for us people, particularly in more developed countries and contemporary societies, to keep in mind is that metaphysics is not necessarily a materialistic or about a naturalistic approach when it relates to epistemology and naturalistic approach to knowledge, right? I mean, it can be about other conceptualizations of reality that are not necessarily based on materialism or some other, some version of that that tends to go associated with a um, scientific inquiry, right? Sure, that that's true. So uh, it's just as much a part of metaphysics, and indeed meta metaphysics, um, to to study reality from uh, an idealistic point of view. For mm -hmm. instance, think of yeah. um, uh, uh, George Berkeley, um, who who had an ide idealistic framework where, uh, which is upheld by God, of course, uh, in in Berkeley's uh, philosophy. But uh, uh, the question is then how. Uh, how do we construct the reality mm -hmm. and how is it dependent on our minds or or God's mind in, in, in Barclay's case? Um, and this is this is not a naturalistic framework, uh, <laughs> but it is a realist framework of sorts, even if it has this idealist mm -hmm. uh, underpinning. And similarly, you could you could start from from other starting points like that. Those would those would be in the scope of metaphysics uh, mm -hmm. very much so. that's that's true. So let's put a pin on the realistic uh, bit of it, the realistic mm -hmm. bit that you mentioned there, because we're going to get into that in a second. But sure. in your first answer, you mentioned ontology, or uh, if I remember correctly, ontological entities, for example. Are there differences between metaphysics and ontology? Because, of course, I'm not a philosopher myself, but I have to, to tell you that many times when I hear philosophers talking about metaphysics and ontology, I, I'm not completely sure if there's a strict separation there and if there's one, ex uh, where exactly it falls. So, yeah, good. That is a good question to, to, to ask. Um, Often the the notions of metaphysics and ontology are used more or less synonymously, yeah. but we we can definitely make a distinction uh, between them. Um, and I suppose you might say that ontology is a slightly narrower notion. So mm -hmm. if onto, onto, ontology studies what there is, uh, metaphysics studies uh, something um, uh, sort of a broader set of set of things. Let's say okay. met metaphysics might include the study of uh, free will. Ontology, perhaps not so. Um, so uh, I, I, this is a rough and ready distinction, I must I must say. So we we could make make a more formal distinction, but given that people use these notions quite synonymously often, it's not it's not easy to do so. Um, so sometimes, equally, the notions of meta metaphysics and meta ontology are used uh, synonymously like this. But you might think that meta ontology is a slightly narrower area of uh, of focus again. Whereas meta metaphysics studies metaphysics as a whole, or the methodology of metaphysics as a whole, and ontology is focused on um, something a bit more precise 
such as uh, what falls into those categories uh, of, of being and what, what does exist. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so what are the different uh, theories about how we can classify and categorize reality? I mean, I, I guess that I've already ended up mentioning and you a few of them, like, for example, the materialistic ones or the idealistic ones. But how would you categorize, let's say, the different approaches out there? Yeah, good. Yeah, we've we've mentioned uh category ontological categories uh, already a few times um mm -hmm. and uh then these sort of more um i suppose meta metaphysical positions which are realism and idealism or mm -hmm. uh sometimes also we talk about uh, deflationism so we shouldn't really be thinking about metaphysics at all on a deflationary uh, conception because uh, all the questions studied in metaphysics would end up being studied in one of the special sciences or in other areas of philosophy, such as philosophy of language, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So so there are a few different ways to to, to look at that question. Um, yeah. But you can't really answer that before you have some idea about what metaphysics is about either. Um, yeah. so, so, so the way I would see it, um, and, and this is just one answer to it, is that metaphysics is indeed about studying those uh, ontological categories and uh, the different theories about ontological categories could then be idealistic as well as realistic. Mm -hmm. So you might think that okay. um, the different categories of, of property and and uh, and substance and relations and what, whatever those categories are, we can talk more, more about that. But you might think that some of those categorizations are mind dependent or mind independent. So on either view, you would be studying the categorization of reality, right? But you would just have a, have a different perspective on that. I would imagine that probably one of the clearest examples, and please correct me if I'm wrong, of an idealistic stance on metaphysics would be Plato's, right? Yeah, that's that's right. So Plato's uh, answer to, you know, a specific metaphysical problem that has a has a venerable history, the problem of the many, what what is similar across uh, many different things. Um, mm -hmm is is an is an idealistic problem so there's there's a there's a form or an idea of uh something like uh beauty which is shared across all all beautiful things of course and for plato they would be in this platonic heaven um which i suppose is uh is a it's i suppose a mind independent place in some ways yeah. but it's uh, it's idealistic in uh, in the sense that it's not it's not in the material reality in the same way so how do you classify these different uh, historical views is is maybe controversial but but yes there's a there's a level of idealism there by the way you mentioned mind independent there and that's actually something mm -hmm. that sometimes uh, confuses me a little bit when for example people in meta ethics uh, use those kinds of terms i mean about moral values moral truths the moral realists many times say that they are mind independent so I mean, because perhaps it's me that I haven't studied metaphysics or metaethics specifically, or from a or at a, an academic level. So perhaps there is some of this is harder for me to understand because of that. But what does mind independent really mean? I mean, what would that correspond to? Because for us as humans, that, uh -huh. I guess that's very hard to understand when it comes to the metaphysical side of things, what that would correspond to exactly when we're talking about things like concepts, moral values, and other things like that. Good. I mean, I, I think you're asking exactly the right question. I, I've uh, I've used the notion of mind independence or mind dependence, uh, partly because um, we have some sort of intuitive idea of what what that might mean, but actually, it it turns out to be quite difficult to specify it accurately. So, so you're you're right to ask that question. Um, so, um, well, maybe maybe the first thing to say is uh, human minds are 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 of course part of reality, whatever mm -hmm. that reality is. So, in in that sense. Uh, uh, it, it's 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 strange to talk about mind independence because we are we are part of the world and we're studying our own minds just as well as we are studying the rest of reality. So in that sense, uh, everything everything is dependent on the minds 
insofar as minds are part of reality. Mm -hmm. But when when we talk about mind independence in philosophy, the sort of first rough and ready characterization might be something like, well, uh, it's not made up by us uh, yeah. if it's mind independent. So mm -hmm. uh, it's not dependent on what names we might call it or what uh, our thoughts about it might be. This whatever this mind independent thing is, um, yeah. but it's something something uh, that would be exactly the way it is if we weren't here to observe it and yeah. conceptualize it. Um, now, that's uh, that's only a rough and ready answer because you might think of different ways to to problematize it. Think of um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Think of something like. Um, transuranic elements, um, which we synthesize in laboratories, um, uh, elements like Einsteinium. Now, they're not naturally occurring, so uh, they wouldn't exist without us being here to synthesize them. Yeah. But that doesn't really make them mind-dependent in the sense that we might be interested in here, because you might think that, well, if the world had been configured slightly differently, those sort of elements, uh, uh, transuranic elements could exist. They just have very short half-lives and they they uh, disintegrate very quickly. Um, so even if we needed to give some sort of active input to bring that thing into existence, it doesn't make it mind-dependent in any kind of very interesting sense mm -hmm. uh, because we do not design its nature in a way. We do not design what it's like. We just uh, use, use our technological tools to to uh, to bring it about as it were um so I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's helpful but uh, maybe it gives you one way to kind of get a more nuanced sense of what what we might need, mean by mind independence mm -hmm. no I, this is a very interesting discussion to have because I mean I come from a sci mostly scientific background and so perhaps when I think about or when I hear people talking about mind independent, entities mind the independent something out there uh perhaps it's because of my own uh, intellectual framework with the scientific background that i always tend to think as uh, things as instantiated physically or materialistically and so perhaps uh, there's a there's an obstacle there in terms of my intellectual framework in terms of understanding how would something like uh, concepts or moral values would be mind independent because for me honestly mm -hmm. that's almost meaningless because i can't really conceptualize uh, the uh, how uh, so, uh, things like that would exist in reality outside of human minds be uh, because again probably i'm instantiating them uh, uh, physically materialistically so uh, I mean, what, by the mm. way, what do you think about that? Do you think that perhaps when it comes to these metaphysical or meta-metaphysical conceptualizations that perhaps the sort of intellectual frameworks we are operating under limit some of our understanding or perhaps uh, understanding some uh, alternative positions out there that are non-materialistic or something like that? Uh Good, interesting. I mean, there's a few there's a few questions there. I, yeah. I, I mean, firstly, I suppose I would I would say I would say yes. Surely our um, our uh, framework, the framework that we start out with, does limit uh, the way we conceptualize these things or, or conceive of them. But yeah. uh, I mean, that's just the starting point, right? So we can we can kind of uh, discuss and, and and come to an yeah. agreement. Sure. Uh, but uh, on, on the on the sort of uh, the broader question on the background, so how how would uh, something like uh you know normative properties you mentioned meta ethics here and, yeah. and moral moral properties like that how could mm -hmm. they even be mind independent in any sort mm -hmm. of sense well I, I mean there are positions in in sort of moral naturalistic um frameworks where uh, where you might think that uh, there is a way to understand these uh, moral properties as ma material in a, in a sense but that's probably not the usual uh, usual way to way to go because we don't we wouldn't ascribe normative properties to you know fundamental particles or something like that but but you know it could be done people talk about it in panpsychism of course that there's something yeah. in um in something like a mind like um substance already in in in, uh, in fundamental particles but uh, 
that's just to give a give a context for this problem. Uh, the the broader point to make is that if our minds are indeed part of reality and mm -hmm. normative properties are somehow somehow dependent on those minds, then perhaps there is a, a way to understand those normative properties as material, just uh, 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 on the basis of uh, of how our minds minds work in mm -hmm. as instantiated in the material world as well. So if you've got a a physicalistic or materialist view about the mind there's no reason why you couldn't return normative properties in the same way but now we've stepped into metaethics of course so. <laughs> <laughs> no of course i mean let's try to to avoid that because it's really not something that falls under the scope of these interviews so uh, but let's get into realist positions and anti-realist mm. positions in uh, I guess we could say meta metaphysics here. So, what is a realist position? What does that mean exactly? Yeah, so uh, we have anticipated this in a bit, uh, of course, because uh, one way to to define a realist position is by way of mind independence that we have talked about. So, you might say that if, uh, let's say, the ontological categories do exist mind independently in the world, be it, be it material or non-material, by the way. So the, the, the materialist part is a necessary part of realism here. Um, but you, you could say that uh, it's a realist position if those categories exist uh, independently of us. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, whereas an anti-realist position would would then say, uh, I mean, a one version of it would, would say that it is, it is up to us how to... Uh, 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 how to conceptualize, how to divide up reality, and uh, yeah. they, they, the categories do not exist outside our language or outside uh, our own conceptualization. I mean, that's a very rough and ready way to to uh, uh, compare realism and anti-realism. Uh, and of course, uh, I think it's always important to note that uh, you can be realist about some areas of metaphysics mm -hmm. or inquiry and anti-realist about others. So these aren't necessarily okay. uh, correctly conceived as global positions. Mm -hmm. So you might be realist about um, there being a category of, uh, of universals, universal properties such as, uh, such as redness or, or beauty, as I mentioned before from, mm -hmm. from Plato. Um, but you could be anti-realist about, about other things. Let's say, um, you could be anti-realist about those normative properties or uh, social categories or something like that. You could have a different mm -hmm. uh, constructivist view about those sort of things, which is mind-dependent and anti-realist in a in a manner of speaking. Uh, and indeed, probably most of us are realist about some things and anti-realist about about other things. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, let me just ask you about an an example that for me perhaps gets a little bit into murky waters because probably it's very hard to tell where's the separation here between metaphysics and epistemology. Mm -hmm. But getting into, for example, the position of uh, Immanuel Kant when he when he talked about the noumenon and the phenomenon. Um, I mean, uh, I, as I understand it, it would be then a, a realist position, because at least when he talks about the noumenon, he's referring to the existence of something that is mind independent, right? But when it comes to the phenomenon, uh, I mean, is he, or do you think that he would be referring to uh, something metaphysical there, or is he strictly referring to epistemology in the sense that we as humans, with our perceptual limitations, can only live, I guess, psychologically within the, this phenomenological world, but can't really get direct access into what uh, the thing itself or the real world, I guess we could say, mm. is. I mean, what are your ideas about it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I should I should uh, preface this by saying that uh, uh, I'm no Kant scholar, so I leave the Kant <laughs> exegesis to 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 those who can read the original German. But yeah. um, uh, but I, I do know that uh, it, while Kant is usually interpreted as as uh, um, not quite an anti-realist position, but as something that talks about um, uh, or is mainly focused is mainly focused on the on the mind 
dependent categories in our in mm -hmm. our minds that there, yeah. there are uh, different interpretations of Kant where where a, a sort of more realist uh, position is possible but you're right to say that uh, the epistemic and the metaphysical agendas are very mixed up here because mm -hmm. it does seem that uh, Kant accepts the existence of objective reality outside our minds so it's realist position but but perhaps he thought that we just can't get any kind of information about it. So everything that we perceive is filtered through these categories, which are yeah. are uh, sort of anthropocentric uh, uh, biases in a way. Uh, so we we can't get those, get those get those glasses of our of our eyes. Um, but yes, I mean, you, you you might you might have this type of anti realistic reading of, of Kant and, and that's perhaps what he thought but the immediate question is um, where do, where do those categories uh, that that we have in our minds where do those glasses come from and why do they filter reality in this sort of way uh, is it isn't it more likely that there is something of a glimpse of the true structure of reality uh, even if it is filtered through these glasses yeah. um, uh, and uh, indeed, would beings very, very different from us uh, not share at least some of those uh, those categorizations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, something that I was trying to get at with that question is also to what extent um, things that we would classify as mind dependent would also or could also be uh, considered within a realist position that is if uh, things that are that we consider to be mind dependent uh, could also be considered within uh, meta metaphysics uh, as uh, i mean understood within a realist position that is so I, I mean this is mm -hmm. very hard to explain to talk about for me but l let me try my best here so for example, if we're talking about uh, red as a color, there are people out there that would just say that because it is, a, or apparently at least if you understand it through a physics framework, it is just a construct of our, a useful construct of our brains to deal with certain aspects of reality. And then you can mm. also add evolutionary theory to that and neuroscience that uh, red itself does not exist. It's just a useful mind-dependent construct of reality. So uh, some people would just say, so it's not real. And that, that's it. But then there are other people that probably would say that uh, redness exists as a some sort of property of reality. But that property is not exactly what we experience through our senses. And so, I mean, the property itself would be real, but mm. what we experience through our senses, uh, I mean, I guess they would say it's not uh, real. It's just, a, again, a useful construct. But then, I mean, are there positions where perhaps even though what we experience might not correspond to whatever property is out there in reality, people would still consider uh, that mind-dependent mind construct also real. And so there would be two layers, let's say, of reality. Or uh, I mean, I, perhaps I'm being a bit confusing here. I, I'm not sure. Well, no, I think you've... Um, uh... You've captured the situation regarding color quite quite well there, and mm -hmm. I, I am sympathetic to to the idea that you outlined there, which is uh, which is a form of eliminativism about color, so or anti-realism about color, if you like. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the color properties that we talk about, redness and so on, uh, mm -hmm. well, you know, they're part of our phenomenology, um, mm -hmm. but but they don't correspond to real properties mm -hmm. in the in the same sense as well nuclear charge might be <laughs> yeah. um now of course people might might often say when we talk about colors that well look colors they just correspond to the wavelengths of the of the light um yeah. but but the color experience doesn't seem to follow that quite 
quite in, in that way. And indeed, we know mm-hmm. that um, uh, that women and men can experience color quite quite differently, partially because of uh, uh, physical characteristics. Women are better at it. <laughs> yeah, and there are some women actually that are tetrachromatic. I think indeed, so. <laughs> that's what I had in mind. Uh, so so there are there are differences in our color experiences, uh, probably in other ways as well. Yeah. Um, so, so all of these things do do make me um, more sympathetic to the, the, so, a sort of anti-realism about color. It's unfortunate that color is also always the example of a real property that's mentioned because <laughs> of this, but it is what it is. Yeah. Um, but maybe I'll give you another example, and we can okay. we can uh, we can uh, get a bit deeper into this because um, mm-hmm. there are cases which I think you were after that seem like they are mind dependent or indeed not quite real in the same sense as some of those other properties that we might talk about mm-hmm. are, but still we seem to think that we need to be able to talk about them and there's something real behind them. So what's, what's going on there? So think about uh, a mental illness or a psychological uh, uh, mm-hmm. condition of, of some sort like that. Well, that is very much dependent on, on the mind of, of the person that, who has that condition, I suppose. Uh, no one would we'll presumably deny that even if there is a physical uh, uh, characteristic that underpins it. Uh, but also we wouldn't want to say that it's it's not it's not real. It's not a real property to have a have a certain kind of mental illness. Now the right question to ask then is uh, what what underlies, what kind of mechanism perhaps underlies that condition? And then we classify these conditions based on a you know DSM five uh, uh, in, in in psychology, mm-hmm. um, but often often what, what we're sort of classifying, where we're basing those those uh, classifications on, are just um, um, behaviors or something like that that are externally per- perceivable like that. So yeah. when we ask when we try to identify a condition, let's say depression. Um, mm-hmm. Well, we want to know what the underpinning mechanisms are, and is it a single condition, or is it perhaps just a, a variety of different things that come together in, and manifest in that sort of behavior that a de- depressed person typically uh, yeah. manifests? Um, but there's something real behind there. We might we we might just not know what exactly is is giving rise to this condition. And and the right question to then ask is: is it is it one thing, or is it several different things? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, in either case, there's something real there. Maybe there's a real depre- uh, natural kind, as we say, called depression. Or maybe there are several different things going on under there, and we just classify them together as a sort of syndrome, uh, call it depression, because we don't really know what the underlying mechanisms are. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I, I mean, perhaps uh, a sort of metaphor or analogy here to pick on uh, Plato's allegory of the cave would be, I mean, do, do you think that there are stances in metaphysics where people would consider to be real, both the people outside the cave and their shadows inside the cave? I mean, do, do you understand what I'm trying to, uh, to arrive at here? I mean, are, are there instances where people would say, okay, so there's something real out there that is not what we experience but what we experience is also real i mean is there something like that out there or not yeah um hmm. i don't have a good example in mind but uh but maybe we can talk about it in the abstract as well so mm-hmm. um so so uh i mean clearly we 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 if we think of the scientific context, we clearly try to think that we're trying to map reality in some ways. You know, we yeah. talk about talk about properties that are fairly well defined, such as such as uh, electric charge and so on. Mm-hmm. But but let's say let's say that we are in Plato's cave, and what we're actually perceiving are just those those shadows, right? Yeah. Now, uh, I suppose any kind of a, a, a metaphysical realist might still like to say that. Um, well, even if that is the case, um, mm-hmm. we are observing something that is a glimpse of what the real world is is like. So, mm-hmm. um, so you you might think that there's a there's a kind of a magnetism to the real thing that is causing the shadow, even if it is uh, in reality uh, a couple of different things that we're mixing up together, like the depression case maybe, or mm-hmm. uh, it's not exactly as we thought it is because of. Uh, uh, whatever whatever biases or or limitations of knowledge we 
we might have. Mm -hmm. So so you might think that there's, uh, uh, I mean, you could combine this to usual philosophy of science question, uh, discussions like a no miracles argument. There's, it would be a miracle if we if we were able to be so successful in science and make all the predictions in science if we didn't if we hadn't grasped something about the real connections and in, uh, in reality that underlie whatever the shadows on the wall might might show us. Um, so perhaps this is this is uh, tracking what you had in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess it is. I guess it is. So uh, let, let's now move on to another topic. Um, you, In your work, I've read about uh, you writing about the distinction between substance and property. So what is the distinction there? What And what is a substance and what is a property exactly? Yeah, good. So we're, we're getting... Uh, to the basics in that uh, these are often uh, candidates for fundamental ontological categories. Mm -hmm. So we talked about ontological categories right. and substance, the category of substance, the category of property are probably mm -hmm. the two most commonly mentioned ones. Right. Um, now, property is is maybe easier to, uh, to grasp because property is just things like, well, those color properties that we talked about, be they real or not. Uh, yeah. Or indeed, uh, charge or mass or um, spin yeah. uh, to take to take sort of supposedly fundamental physical properties yeah. first, um, uh, and uh, the usual way to talk about this would be that uh, the the properties are instantiated in some way, so mm -hmm. uh, so they are in in reality. Uh, and where are they instantiated? Where well, they might be instantiated in a substance, so something that holds those properties to together. Right. Uh, so, take an electron. Uh, if electron is a substance, it's a it's an it's an object. It has properties. It has uh, unit negative charge, half integer spin, and a certain mass. Now, yeah. those three properties are instantiated in that substance, the electron. Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, here is, which Barclay put better than anyone else that I can think of, is, well, when we observe these things, such as an electron, well, we observe the properties, right? We, right. we can measure the charge and the spin and the mass. But once we take those properties away, where's, right. where's, the, where's the substance? We can't observe right. the substance. We can't, we can't point to the substance uh, unless it's just the matter that uh, uh, constitutes uh, the 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 object but then if you take the mass and the, and and all that away then then that seems to be where the matter goes as well so um that's a, that's a nice way to to immediately problematize the, the distinction between substance and property and of course yeah. some people think that there are no substances there's just mm -hmm. properties bundled together so a bundle theory of properties would say that well that's all there is to be an electron it's to have those properties mm -hmm. but then you still have a problem of saying well what why do those properties go together? What unifies those properties into a single object? Mm -hmm. And that's then to problematize the other side of this. <laughs> so, so I think it's nice to think about uh, the uh, the the obvious thing that uh, the obvious uh, distinction that we we can make here, but uh, the difficulty of actually uh, yeah. making either one of those solutions uh, work. And, mm -hmm. Uh, but but by the way, when we talk here about substances, we are assuming a substance ontology, right? Because there are there's also yeah. uh, other alternatives like a process ontology, and I've just uh, recently started getting into this on the show. I've got into process ontology approaches to psychology, neuroscience, mm -hmm. biology, and other scientific disciplines but we are making that assumption here right that substance ontology is correct yeah so uh, when, when people talk about substance ontology they they generally have in mind something like uh, well something resembling a sort of traditional aristotelian picture mm -hmm. where where substance is is uh, uh in some ways the primary category uh yeah. So, uh, so you have to have a substance, and it has to be uh, characterized by some properties, as as we just talked about. Um, yeah. But yes, you could have a different kind of ontology. So, so we're just talking about the two categories. So you could have a two category ontology. You have substance, and you have properties. But uh, you could you could just have the properties. People have tried to uh, try to get a buy with just one category of properties. 
But then uh, some people have proposed that, well, if you really want to capture everything that's going on in reality and in, in science, uh, you have to talk about events or processes as well, mm -hmm. as, you, as you've pointed out. So some people think that we need a category of event or process. Uh, mm -hmm. And indeed, that is uh, really a fundamental category because things develop over time. Uh, like processes do and we can't really understand um what reality without you know including that dimension and, and as a fundamental part of it so i think that that's something that motivates process ontologies uh biological processes in particular if we want to understand those um so um but, yeah but by the way as you understand it uh, process ontologists do you think that they are completely excluding I mean, to put it perhaps in simplistic terms, uh, things, substances, objects out there. Because, because I, mean, I mean, maybe, again, this is perhaps some of the limitations that are inherent to uh, the way we approach science in the West. This is something that I've already also talked about on the show. I mean, we tend to think about uh, things, about atoms for example electrons and perhaps we're going to get into that later on when we talk when we talk about building blocks but um, even the process ontologists unless you just uh, talk uh, about things in mathematical terms like in complexity science i mean you don't need to use terms like uh, atoms electrons uh, I, I don't know um, personality traits or something like that if you just want to present things math in mathematical terms, but uh, even in psychology, neuroscience, and so on, people still talk about uh, things. I mean, it's, it's not just the process itself, but uh, things. So, uh, I mean, are they excluding co or completely excluding something that we would call uh, substances or that people in metaphysics would understand their substances or no good so uh, so not necessarily so you mm -hmm. could you could think that processes or events are a fundamental ontological category but you could still also accept substances mm -hmm. you know processes could be okay. something that happens to the substances and the substances yeah. carry their properties with them through this process or something like that so uh, uh you know you could have you could have uh as you know aristotle had 10 categories fundamental categories um yeah. and some of them included event like uh categories uh contemporary metaphysicians try to get away with fewer ontological categories so mm -hmm. uh, you you would see a trend that well if you can get away just with processes you you, you should pro probably try that and similarly yeah. um uh, there are uh, people who think that relations are the fundamental category so structural mm -hmm. realism is is a position in this space where you where you try to eliminate the category of substance and mm -hmm. uh, and just uh, say that um relations are are the more fundamental or at least equally fundamental as 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 the things so so you know all of these options are open in the in the logical uh, space but all other things being equal if you think you can do all the explaining you need in science and in metaphysics with fewer categories then you should you know get a get by with fewer categories that i think that's a widely shared shared motivation okay so could you tell us now what is a first philosophy what it really means because i i mean when i was 18 years old i ventured into reading Descartes' uh, meditations on first philosophy, <laughs> and perhaps you now can finally explain to me what that really means, because back then I was really confused. <laughs> Good. Um, I think I mentioned uh, first philosophy in passing uh, in in uh, in giving my Aristotelian motivation. So it, it it's a term that comes from from Aristotle. Okay, Descartes was reflecting on on the same yeah. uh, same topic and 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 many people after him, but um, but it's an Aristotelian idea um, where metaphysics is something like um, the foundation of our um, of our philosophical uh, inquiry. So um, uh, so then, if you study if you study some of the so called special sciences, um, you study biology or you study physics, you know Aristotle's physics. Uh, yeah. included here then then those would be uh, somehow more constrained areas of inquiry 
whereas metaphysics would be studying the whole of reality uh, and uh, and not perhaps going into the same level of detail about all those other things. Now, maybe maybe from a contemporary perspective, you, you could just talk about philosophy and then the special sciences. Um, but metaphysics, at least to, to my mind, does have this sort of a prior role um, to, to other areas of, uh, of, of philosophy, um, precisely because you can't really say very much about any of the specialist topics, such as, you know, ethics or or indeed epistemology, if you don't have some idea of what the, what the metaphysics are like. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you always start um, in a temporal order, first doing metaphysics and then doing these other things. Uh, it's it's more of a uh, more of an ontological claim that yeah. uh, that you need a metaphysical underpinning for whatever it is that you're doing, because you can't otherwise, uh, you know, constrain your inquiry in the in the correct way, if you like. Um, not sure if that's going to uh, solve all your <laughs> your problems from your from your youth and reading Descartes, but uh, but I hope it it makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And <laughs> another thing that I read about in your work is about the notion of a minimal truth maker. So what is that? What we, what are we talking about here in the context of uh, meta metaphysics? Uh, good. So. Um... Uh, to keep it simple, let's let's first uh, just uh, uh, specify what uh, what a truth maker is. So okay. a truth maker is is thought to be something. Um, I mean, people have different views about exactly how this is to be specified, but it's it's something that makes a given sentence, a given proposition, true. So if you have a, uh, if you have a, a claim such as there are electrons in the world. Yeah. Well, that claim we we think is true, and it's made true by uh, by the fact that there are electrons, or indeed by the actual electrons, the entities that uh, that exist. You know, assuming that they exist. So uh, we want to be able to to track the truth values of our uh, of our sentences, the truth of our propositions, and uh, to do so, we need to be able to uh, uh, give uh, uh, or point to the the relevant truth makers. So, so the proposition or the sentence would be the truth bearer and whatever makes it true uh, is the truth maker. Um, so some people just talk about facts, like I mentioned the fact that there are electrons, but the fact that there are electrons could uh, be thought to consist of, uh, of the actual uh, material things in the world, the electrons. Now, uh, so that's that's I think a fairly intuitive sense of uh, of of, a, of truth makers. So so we need something that makes things true. There might be things that are, um, uh, you know, that where there's difficult to point to the truth maker, such as uh, some necessary truths, uh, uh, and there's a discussion about these things. But uh, but these are these are kind of uh, uh, specific uh, specific issues of how you you specify the truth maker theory. So you might think that not all truths need truth makers in this sort of uh, this sort of way as well. But I do think that the notion of of minimal truth maker that you've mentioned has a, has a mm -hmm. special importance because uh, you might say things like this. You know, someone asks, "Well, um, what what makes it true that there are there are electrons? What what makes it what makes anything true?" And someone can give you an answer that that is correct, strictly speaking, which is to say that well, the world the world makes it so. You know, the world as a whole, the universe. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you might hear an answer like this. And, you know, strictly speaking, it's it's a correct answer because the world does include those electrons as well. But it includes all the other things as well. It includes, it includes everything, absolutely everything. So just to say that, well, all, all the true claims that you might utter are made true by the world as a whole is not very informative. And this is where we need the notion of a minimal truth maker, which is just a uh, smallest portion of reality that does make that proposition true. Now, using the same example, there are electrons. That proposition is made true by any one of the individual electrons, if there are many, uh, that exist. Mm -hmm. You need just one of them for that proposition to be true. Uh, but uh, you don't need to mention anything further than that first one of them that you encounter to uh, uh, to give you know the full truth maker for that for that uh, proposition, as it were. So uh, uh, we want to be we want to be able to track uh, 
the truth of the of whatever claims you make as accurately as possible. We might not always be in a position to do so, in which case we could uh, go to the higher level, but uh, that's that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And what are natural kinds? I mean, when we, in philosophy people refer to natural kinds, what do they mean by that? Good. Um, this is a topic that I've uh, I've written a lot about, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually think that natural kinds are one of the fundamental categories, uh, one of the fundamental ontological categories which we've talked about. So, um, the good way to think about this is is uh, is by by mentioning those examples. I've been using the electron example all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so electrons would be uh, a potential uh, example of a, of a natural kind, as would be things like uh, water or gold or uh, you know things like that. Also, biological species are often mentioned as as candidates. Mm -hmm. There's controversy about what exactly. Uh, should be should be contained in in, in those natural kinds and uh, uh, people debate especially about whether things like psychological kinds I mentioned depression before mm -hmm. or uh, social kinds such as money or right. you know race or gender would mm -hmm. then would those be natural kinds um, either way uh, what makes a natural kind real is is often thought to be something like that criteria of mind independence in which case some of those social kinds that i mentioned would be uh, immediately problematic yeah but they're less problematic if we uh, specify that mind dependence criterion a bit more but but usually uh, the sort of less controversial examples are supposed to be more fundamental uh, kinds such as such as those chemical kinds you know gold uh, or water or indeed electrons, but there's debates about all of these. Um, as as a matter of fact, <clears throat> but um, I think the sort of broader motivation here is to answer one of the questions that I mentioned earlier, which is what um, what keeps the properties together of uh, of something like an electron. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can uh, refer to the natural kind uh, universal that is underlying uh, any kind of natural kind such as an electron, then that would be responsible for keeping those properties uh, together, uh, whether or not you have substances, in fact. So, uh, I mean, I guess that it's important to keep in mind here that when people talk about natural kinds, they do not necessarily have a reductionist <laughs> approach to them. That is, they are not necessarily trying to reduce everything to physics, for example, as some people try to do or some people suggest that we should do. Right. Yeah, that's true. So um, some people take the view in philosophy of science that uh, a natural kind is whatever we need um, in, in science to... Um, uh, make inductive generalizations and, and mm -hmm. predictions. So, and you might think that you need all sorts of higher level kinds for that purpose, including uh, psychological kinds that that we've we've mentioned here. Um, and you might think that there's nothing particularly um, uh, uh, well, particularly metaphysically interesting behind those things, except that they are a useful epistemic tool. Uh, so that might be you might take a sort of an instrumentalist view of, of kinds as well. Uh, so so it depends on on what you what you regard natural kinds to be, uh, what their reality is is in this sense. But you're right to, to say that you don't have to be reductionist uh, mm -hmm. about um, about kinds. Um, although I'm sympathetic to some some of the more reductionist views about them, I should say. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I actually have to tell you that I, I used to be one of those people that thought that perhaps we should try to <laughs> idealistically reduce everything to physics, but perhaps the way I got out of there was not very common. It was just that uh, I noticed that I was not intelligent enough to, to deal with physics. <laughs> I just prefer to deal with things in biological, even chemical and psychological terms. <laughs> it's easier for me. I, uh, if I can add one thing on that, I think uh, we shouldn't confuse the reductionist project as... as uh, um, you know, reducing everything to this to the language of theoretical 
or fundamental physics, if you like. Mm -hmm. So you could still you could still hold on to those uh, uh, terms, the biological concepts, for instance, or chemical concepts, even if you thought that uh, metaphysically there there yeah. is a reduction down there. But um, I mean that doesn't mean that it's easy to you know perform that reduction. But I don't think that we have to eliminate all the higher level terminology, mm -hmm. even if we have a reduction. Sure. Uh, and I, I guess that uh, I hope this is a good point to introduce this topic because I had saved it for later on in our conversation. Mm. But since you've already mentioned uh, terms like fundamental here several times, yeah. what does that mean exactly? Be because it, so, uh, it might seem obvious, but perhaps the notion of fundamentality in metaphysics is more complicated than just thinking that oh it's something that is really at the basis of reality just to put it in simple terms perhaps mm -hmm. it's more complicated than that right well it's so the way we use the notion of fundamentality in, in philosophy and metaphysics it's certainly related to the sort of colloquial use of fundamentality so we talk about fundamental physics well what does it deal with well something like the standard model of particle physics it lists yeah. uh uh, all these all these things that uh, do not have further structure that we know of anyway um, mm -hmm. and uh, and they've sort of built up other things in some ways yeah so so that that is one view and I suppose a fairly common view about fundamentality mm -hmm. uh, but it has it uh, has in its uh, background the idea that uh, the, whatever the the bigger things are what the higher level things are they yeah. depend in some sense on the lower level things so so often we we are interested in this sort of comparative fundamentality we say well you know electrons are more fundamental than uh than uh, the atoms that uh they are part of yeah uh so the the part of is key there so we we're looking for the the smallest parts in some ways but that's that is just one way to think about fundamentality um you know this sort of a meriological part whole structure mm -hmm. and in fact you might think that there are reasons uh, uh, to conceive of the whole, the bigger uh, part of the universe, as it were, as the more fundamental one. So Jonathan Schaffer famously argues for this type of view. Uh, but uh, you might you might look at fundamentality slightly differently as well. You might you might think that well, it's not necessarily the smallest thing or the or the largest thing, but it's it's whatever you need to get everything that there is. So. What I mean by that is uh, uh, that you, you need some sort of uh, basis um, and not necessarily the smallest thing basis, but some some sort mm -hmm. of ontological basis uh, that is is minimal in that you don't need anything else, just like with minimal truth makers. Um, but it's sufficient to give you all the other structure, or all the all the other entities that there are in the world. And that basis could then be uh, complicated in various ways. It could involve uh, dependence relations uh, among its itself uh, and it could in brief include bigger and smaller things perhaps but that would give you you know everything that there is so that's that's one way to look at fundamentality you 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 try to focus on the smallest uh group of entities or facts if you like that give you everything else and when it comes to fundamentality, as we tend to think about it in the context of physics, for example, I mean, I guess that the picture over time is getting increasingly complicated because now we not only have electrons, but also quarks and other smaller entities, I guess we could call them. So, I mean, really... If you're trying to build a picture of fundamentality in metaphysics or reality, whatever you want to call it, then on the basis of the smallest possible entities that we can find, uh, I guess that over time it's getting increasingly complicated to really uh, uh, find the smallest possible thing that we can find out there. Yeah, definitely, and of course we've uh, we've we've assumed a number of times, or science has assumed a number of times that we're already there. We've found the smallest yeah. things, uh, but there's further substructure that is is just being discovered uh, afterwards. And who's to say that there wouldn't be even further substructure? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that doesn't matter so much for the philosophical idea of fundamentality mm -hmm. uh, right. if you just think that it's well, whatever the smallest things are. Yeah. But uh, if there were to be uh, an infinite 
sequence going down <laughs> then that would be that would be a problem and that's perhaps where you could motivate some some alternative views so if there isn't a bottom level to be to to be discovered if there is some some sort of infinite descent of uh, of dependence on on uh, lower down then then that would be a problem for some of these some of these views now of course there wouldn't be any way to to really know that that's the case because if it's an infinite descent then you know you're never going to get to the end but of course, there isn't really a way to know that there isn't such a descent either, because uh, yeah. you know you, you you've only seen as much as you've seen, <laughs> right? And perhaps uh, I mean, in, uh, to some extent, this would warrant, or at least some people would immediately bring to the table an anti-realist position or stance and say something along the lines of. Oh, I mean, there's nothing really more fundamental or smaller out there. It's just the way you are conceptually uh, uh, conceptually parsing reality out, right? Something along those lines. Yeah, uh, I suppose that's true. Uh, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the end result of that line of reasoning is, though. Is it just that there's we should just focus on reality as a as a whole rather than mm -hmm. Uh, its parts um, but you might still think that there are dependence relations between those parts so yeah. so we, there's still questions that we might we might ask um but but you're right i mean especially if there isn't epistemologically a, a, any way to know the truth it might seem that uh that it's it's more of a conceptual um, exercise now I, I mean one thing that people also say in this in this uh, uh discussion about fundamentality that is sort of supposed to get your intuitions rolling is that well the fundamentalist is is just what what god had to do to make the world what it's like uh, give that sort of a that sort of metaphor um now uh, i'm not saying that i necessarily like that metaphor but it does give you the idea that well you, you just get the minimal bits in place whatever they are you know they could be idealistic pieces as well uh and uh if that's enough to get you going with the world then 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 so be it um yeah. you know the alternative is to list every single thing that there is in the world i suppose yeah and i mean i guess that we also have to keep in mind that when it comes to the more epistemological side of things here there's it's always the case that wherever approach you have to epistemology it doesn't necessarily have to be the epistemology that works within science or the scientific method, it can be any other sort of epistemology. But when you really get down to it, there's a certain number of axioms that you just have to accept as true and can't really be proven. Uh, other, I mean, you just have to take them at face value and believe in them to really then build up the rest of your epistemological approach i mean at the end of the day there's nothing that we can do uh, about that right it's just how things work i guess yeah yeah so uh, i mean it sounds to me that you're kind of describing a sort of foundationalist epistemology where you have to take some primitives uh you know that mm -hmm. you, you you express your commitment to those and then you yeah. just try to try to construct the rest of your epistemology on on the mm -hmm. basis of that, and 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 I mean that's right. Although not everyone accepts that sort of view of epistemology either. So you could have a sort of a, what might be called a, a coherentist view of of reality, uh, okay. uh, uh, where where you have all all your different all, all the different parts of your epistemic framework sort of um, uh, being related to each other and even being circularly dependent in some some ways um mm -hmm. now how how exactly you specify that is 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 problematic because um it seems to violate some of the basic principles that we have in mind which is uh, uh that you know there's always an explanation uh, and the explanation isn't circular you know if you if you just keep on uh, giving the same answer to to mm -hmm. the why question then it doesn't yeah. seem like you're giving a satisfactory answer necessarily but are there many I guess we could call them coherentists out there. I mean, to, to what extent is the uh, how how popular is this view? Exactly. That, mm, that's a good question. I'm I'm not sure if I've got a good sense of how popular it is in epistemology, more broadly speaking. 
but yeah. uh, it has been been spilling into this discussion of fundamentality this idea of, of metaphysical coherentism and uh, i mean it's not a popular view but it is a view that is um um i suppose defended by some explicitly and entertained by others as as one possible way to uh, way to understand reality where um i suppose you can motivate it with with contemporary science as well because we don't seem to find those sort of independent building blocks so easily you know uh, uh, for instance um if you consider uh, quantum theory uh, things seem to have dependencies that we uh, wouldn't have thought that they do if in uh, in entangled mm -hmm. systems uh, for instance and so on so that gives you gives you a motivation to um to look at look at a more holistic or coherentist explanation uh, of of, uh, of the phenomena that, that we're mm -hmm. exploring yeah and, and please don't get me wrong you and my audience uh, by asking you whether it is popular or not or how popular it is i was not trying to make an ad populum argument here <laughs> i mean because sure. that's also usually a fallacy it can be informative to some extent yeah. but it's usually a fallacy so i was just uh, out of curiosity trying to know or understand better if there are many people out there defending this view or or not yeah i understand that no yeah but it's it's a it's an alternative that's received serious consideration i'll give you that <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So j just to cover a few more concepts here mm -hmm. uh, before we get into our last question. So we've talked about things like uh, natural kinds, for example. What is essence? I mean, b because that's also another word that probably in common parlance we use in slightly different ways than the philosophers in metaphysics or metametaphysics would use. So what mm -hmm. do the philosophers mean by that? Yeah, good. I, I've, I've avoided the notion so far because I suspected we might talk about it as well. And, yeah. and because it's um, it's it's a notion that um, has an air of mystery about it for a lot of people. So uh, uh, let's start with an example. So so um, uh, we talked about natural kinds and it's it's sometimes said that the essence of a natural kind, such as gold, is that, well, it's just the element with atomic number 79. So you look at its mm -hmm. microstructure or something like that. So its essence or its nature is that it has that sort of microstructure. Yeah. Or look at Aristotle exam Aristotle's examples of essence. I mean, it's an Aristotelian notion, really. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the essence of uh, Socrates is that, you know, he's a rational animal or something like that or capable yeah. of humor, or what have you, you know, uh, you can give all sorts of examples. It doesn't really matter what the, uh, uh, what the, uh, what, what the correct answer is in, in some of those cases. The, the point is that when you give the essence of some entity, uh, yeah. th you're, you're trying to give something like it's, like it's uh, nature, it's, uh, it's definition, but not just uh, its definition in language, but it's real definition as Aristotle puts it so what it is to be that very entity and it turns out to be quite difficult to specify that uh, you might start by listing uh, sort of necessary properties you think that well socrates is necessarily a, a human uh, mm -hmm. socrates couldn't have been uh, uh, you know a, a plant for instance uh, so so that seems to tell you something about the nature of socrates but but in some some ways that's just uh, your your intuition about it now mm -hmm. When when I specify the notion of essence, I, I like to I, I like to give a, a very precise uh, account of it, which is to say that well, when you give the essence of a given entity, when you when you state it, you're stating its identity and existence conditions. So what it is to be that kind of entity, and what it would it take for it to exist, and that's saying something a bit more than just giving those sort of um, intuitive uh, accounts of it, because. Yeah. Uh, for something to exist, uh, you you also know need to know what other things need to hold for that thing to be able of existing. So, um, you might think that, uh, well, you, you might think that uh, the natural kind water, which is often thought of having as its essence as as it being H two O, well, yeah. in some ways, I mean that's debatable, but uh, uh, there's something true there for sure, which is to say that. Uh, you couldn't have water if you didn't have oxygen and you didn't have hydrogen. And not only that, but 
oxygen and hydrogen need to be arranged in a specific way uh, mm -hmm. so that you have you have the water molecule there. Uh, so so what you're trying to do when you're trying to then give the the essence of of some natural kind like that is is to try to figure out all those connections that it might have to other entities. Uh, what are the conditions that need to be in place for it to exist? And that, I suggest, is something that you you get partially with the help of science and and partially by uh, by the help of sort of more metaphysical reasoning about it. Um, but th that's that's just one view about essence. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people would regard it as a, on a more conceptual basis that it is uh, something that uh, that we capture in language. Or that uh, it's just the necessary properties that something has, or yeah. some sort of a bundle of the properties that uh, that the thing has. So there's debate about what exactly essence, how how we should metaphysically characterize essence. Do you think that uh, scientists use uh, terms like essence in a similar way that philosophers do? Because, for example, in Biology, nowadays it's very common for us to hear from evolutionary biologists that we shouldn't think about species in essentialist terms. There are many anti-essentialist stances in science out there, not only in biology, but also many times in sociology when it comes to terms like race, for example, and stuff like that. So... Uh, I mean, as a philosopher, how do you look at the way uh, scientists in those examples and others use mm. the term essence? Do you think that it's similar to the way ph philosophers use it or not? Well, it's it's similar to the way that some philosophers have used it in the past, at least. So okay. uh, those those anti-essentialist tendencies in, in, in biology, for instance, that you, you mentioned... Uh, have as their source um, a, a kind of what I think is an obsolete view of uh, of essence, which is to okay. regard essence as something that's necessarily intrinsic. Mm -hmm. uh, so something like the DNA of a biological species, for instance. Right. So that is what you know Kripke and Putnam at one one time when they popularized talk of essences of natural kinds might might have thought or certainly wrote. Uh, but that is a that is a very constrained view of of what what essences are. It might be correct for some things, but um, uh, from the description that I just gave you, uh, it can't be the whole story because uh, to give the essence of something, I, de I, I I I think that we need to give the relations that it has to other things as well. So for a biological species, that would presumably in include its history or its uh, mm -hmm. or its lineage, yeah. not just its its DNA. So this is debated. There there are people who still uh, defend forms of biological essentialism, but they are almost exclusively people who uh, s somehow include extrinsic properties, such as the historical lineage that um, uh, a biological species might have. And I think that that's the only way that we should ever have understood essentialism. So there's a bit of a misconception and a bad reputation for the notion of essence because of this. Mm hmm so we've talked about essence. Uh, I wanted to ask you also about uh, concepts like ground and modality, mm -hmm. and then to understand the relationship that essence, ground, and modality have among them. So uh, tell us first perhaps about ground, and then we'll go through the rest. Yeah, good. Um... So so the notion of, of ground or grounding is is is. Uh, kind of a term of art in philosophy right now, which has been enjoying a, a, a lot of popularity in recent years. Uh, but we've already, I think, because we've already touched on topics like fundamentality, mm -hmm. it might be easiest to specify it in, in those terms. So okay. some people think that uh, what fundamentality is about is is really just about what grounds what. So I've talked about it, this in terms of dependence. Mm -hmm. um, and grounding is a type of metaphysical dependence relation. Uh, if if usually usually it's conceived in this sort of way, so you mm -hmm. might say that. Well, let's start from the H two H two O molecule. Uh, you'd say that the existence of the H two O molecule is grounded in the existence of uh, the hydrogen and the oxygen, or the fact that the hydrogen and oxygen exist, and the existence of those atoms is grounded in the in the fact that their, you know, parts exist and so on. And you might end up at the fundamental level like this. Yeah. So this is just a type of dependence, uh, dependence structure, really, 
which, uh, which is captured with the notion of, of grounding, uh, something holds in virtue of something else. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a bit of a debate about how best to characterize grounding, what, what, the, what the properties of this type of relation is. And there's a debate also about whether this is the only notion of dependence that we need or whether there are mm -hmm. different kinds of notions of dependence. Uh, I'm perhaps more inclined to think that the latter, that uh, while grounding is a useful concept, we may need other notions of dependence mm -hmm. as well. But um, it's probably the most popular way to formulate this notion of fundamentality. It's just trying to find the ground level, as it, as it were, or what what uh, everything bottoms out, out on. Mm -hmm. And then what is modality? Good. So modality is um, is a broader uh, term that in philosophical context is usually uh, captured with possibility and necessity, but it includes other things as well in philosophy. Um, yeah. We talk about deontic modality, for instance. So uh, I have a I have a duty to uh, be respectful for other people. That would be a sort of a, a modal concept. Um, but uh, but the most common usage is probably uh, to uh, to the notions of possibility and, and necessity. So uh, uh, those are those are modal concepts and modal epistemology would study mm -hmm. the epistemology of those modal concepts. How do we know that something's necessary, for instance? <clears throat> and so, what is then the relationship between essence, ground, and modality? So um, if we start with essence and modality, uh, they were they were conceived uh, at some point to be uh, really the uh, two sides of the same coin again. So you might say that uh, uh, what is uh, what is necessary is essential and what is accidental is is possible. So um, so you, I listed those necessary properties that Socrates might have. You might give the essence of Socrates in this sort of way, but that isn't quite right according to sort of Aristotelian line of thinking. Um, essence would would be a prior notion to modality in this sort of way. So all the all the modal truths that you might have, all the truths that you might state about necess necessity or possibility, would ultimately be um, made true in virtue of the natures of things, the essences of things. So if that's right. Then essence is the prior uh, prior concept, and you can explain modality or reduce modality to essence. Now that's it's a slightly controversial view, but there is a significant number of people in the sort of neo Aristotelian camp who would who would subscribe to something like this. And in fact, you could you could try to uh, express this relationship in terms of grounding. So sometimes you, you would hear people saying that modality or necessity is grounded in essence. Now. I actually don't think that that's quite right, but uh, uh, that's uh, how you might see that these all these three notions would be related. That that grounding is uh, is something that explains these uh, these relations between different things, and uh, what the relationship between essence and modality is just this. Um, but uh, this is slightly complicated because uh, if you, I, I just said that you could reduce modality to essence, grounding is not always thought of as a re reductive concept like this. So you might think that even if the higher level things are grounded in the low level things, that doesn't make the higher level things any less real than the low level things. So it's just expresses a notion of dependence between them. So how exactly you relate all these notions will depend a little bit of, on how you think about uh, the correct way of, of, of cashing out both grounding and uh, and the relationship between essence and modality, if you like. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, a very uh, brief introduction. But... <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. M maybe somewhere in the future we can dive <laughs> deeper into the the questions that would arise here. But uh, I mean, I would imagine that when it comes to thinking, for example, about what is, I guess we could say, essential to a particular um, category. La 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 let's say we are talking about humans, what is a human uh, I mean, we could say, oh, it's an individual from the species Homo sapiens, or it's a living being that has this or that kind of uh, psychological properties, for example, that distinguishes them from individuals of other 
species out there uh, and we, uh, perhaps everyone would agree that when it comes to the accidentals i mean the fact that i was born in portugal and portuguese i guess that everyone would agree that that when it comes to thinking about what a human is that would be just an accidental property and the fact that they have brown hair and all of that right um Yes, I mean all all that you say is 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 right, but um, uh, maybe I missed on which, what question you want me to focus on. Uh, I, I mean, I was just, I was just giving that for for the audience that uh, mm. as an example. I mean, in terms of the, perhaps some of the ways by which sometimes philosophers think about something that is necessary or something that is right. just accidental. Wait, yes that yeah that's right yeah i mentioned the accidental properties without really uh describing that but yeah that's right the, uh all those sort of things or it's accidental that uh, that i'm a philosopher or that socrates was a philosopher rather than a carpenter or something like that uh that's that's usually right but then when it comes to specifying the the really necessary or mm -hmm. essential properties then that that may be uh, a more difficult question mm -hmm. Right. No, yeah, because again, we can try to perhaps ground it in a way in uh, DNA, differences in DNA between different species, or even do not think about species at all and cache it in non-biological terms, what what makes for a human and what is a non-human. I mean, it's, it's very complicated. You can even cache it in religious terms if you want it, I guess, so, uh, and base it all in... I don't know, reveal truth or <laughs> something along those lines or some sort of theology. But anyway, mm -hmm. mo moving on, um, I, I want to ask you about another concept mm. before we get into our last question. So what is a structure? Mm, structure, yeah. We've we've talked a lot about st structure of reality, actually, in, in passing here, uh, but just in a sort of... Uh, superficial uh such just as a superficial notion really so um, yeah. it, it, the notion is used as a as a sort of specific technical technical term but i think that the, maybe the best way to to conceive of it is as uh uh dependence relations so yeah. whatever dependence relations hold in the world that's a, a notion that i keep going back to as well so whatever mm -hmm. structure that is that there is in the world it must be must be somehow um governed by dependence relation of of, of some sort um, and they could be these sort of uh, existence conditions so something depending for its existence on another thing that would give you a sort of a structural relation uh, and uh, and some people think that when they talk about structure they are just talking about fundamentality or grounding or the mm -hmm. relationship between those so all of these notions are are very closely related um, but uh, people might differ then uh, depending on on uh, how they specify one of those notions what what happens to the others mm -hmm. and, and so the final question i would like to ask mm -hmm. you is you wrote this very interesting article where you argue that there are no building blocks to reality so what is the main argument there and by the way what what do you mean by building blocks in this particular context? Yeah, so uh, I think you're referring to a, a, a popular article that I yes. that I wrote on this, um, which I th I think that the the title is 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 more provocative than I would like to be because I, I I'd like to be more <laughs> neutral on on the question, but <laughs> but yeah, often yeah. often often uh, we uh, journalists want us to to have uh, clickbait titles. No, sure, <laughs> <laughs> just to get that out of the way. But uh, but I, I I do take that option seriously in any case, so I'm happy to talk about it. So. Yeah. So start with the building building blocks. So so the building blocks is just a um, an intuitive term for whatever whatever the fundamental things might be. Okay. So so I like to think of it in terms of uh, what I specified before. So the minimal uh, sort of minimal set of of, of mm -hmm. things or even conditions that gives mm -hmm. you everything else. But you could think of it just as the you know the standard model of particle physics or something like that. Okay. Um, 
So, so if those are your building blocks, what does it mean if there aren't any? Well, it might mean something like the infinite structure that we sort of uh, uh, passed passed on in, in passing. So, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, there are no building blocks if there is an infinite in, infinite descent of 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 structure, if you like, going and and there's never any any bottom level that you you encounter. Uh, but I think that. Uh, even in that sort of scenario, there is a way to 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 develop an interesting view because uh, even if you had an infinite descent, uh, it could be it could be uh, uh, repeating in some sense. So so if you if you think of um, uh, us finding some sort of substructure in electrons, for instance, there's some sub electrons, and uh, and then you uh, then you were to find that uh, there's some sort of patterns that repeat in that. In that structure yeah. that you find from there, that maybe that you could express in a in an in an algorithmic form of some sort, uh, then that would give you a principle that would sort of produce uh, whatever you have in reality, the minimal conditions for producing yeah. whatever else you have in reality. So even even in that sense, um, there could be something that could be conceived of as uh, as a structure and as mm -hmm. even potentially fundamental structure. Even if you wouldn't really have that that sort of building blocks uh, metaphor in a, in, a, in any sensible uh, sense, because you wouldn't have the the smallest things in in a way. So, um, uh, if if we're open minded to about what those building blocks might be, then uh, then I, I feel uh, that it's unlikely that there wouldn't be any. But uh, uh, I would leave the option open. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but do you think that if this view would be right, um, that we, uh, I, I mean, even going uh, just a level above electrons and protons, mm. that it would make sense for us to still talk about things like atoms or that we should just, when it comes to the, fin the fundamental structure of reality, perhaps we should try to cash it out in different uh, terms. So uh, are you asking if this view were true, that there weren't any building blocks mm -hmm. in yes. reality, then mm -hmm. then would that would that undermine our, our, our talk of, of the building? Uh, uh, our, our talk okay. of... Um, Part, uh, let's put it in terms of particles. So, so uh, okay, so so perhaps right. even moving one level above electrons and protons to the level of atoms, uh, uh, I mean, would that also be undermined in some way or yeah, not yeah, necessarily? No, okay, I see. Yeah, so uh, people uh, people have argued that if you if you didn't have any building blocks, then then. Uh, uh, these sort of composed entities like atoms, you know, wouldn't wouldn't get off the ground as it were, because you don't have you don't have any basis for them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's that's quite right because um, you would still have these dependence relations that we've been talking about in place. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would have structure in this sort of sense. Uh, so uh, even even if um, uh, even if you couldn't give, give uh, the sort of reductive basis for those things uh, the, at, at, at the level of atoms, for instance, because you wouldn't be able to point on the smallest things that they depend on, you would mm -hmm. still have uh, uh, isolated uh, uh, sort of networks of dependence that could be informative for you. So you could still say that, well, the atoms definitely depend on um, the protons and the neutrons and the electrons yeah. in some way. Uh, and that would be informative and true, mm -hmm. uh, even if you even if you didn't know what what comes after that. So it depends how you how you constrain that that discussion. But I do think that it could still make sense to talk about these things. I mean, it better make sense because we talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> but but do you think that these would, uh, if that was true, it would warrant a sort of a relational ontology instead of a substance ontology or not necessarily yeah i mean it could speak in favor of of some sort of relational uh, ontology um but uh, the trouble with that relational ontology well one one issue with relational ontology is that we often think of relations as being relations between things between entities <laughs> Yeah. not necessarily substances but between mm -hmm. things or potentially properties so it's difficult to to uh get rid of that 
idea. And in fact, there's the opposite uh, idea that you could you could develop. It's that there are really no relations. There are just uh, the things that have dependencies between them. Mm -hmm. But but those dependencies are entirely explained by whatever properties those two things have. Uh, so that the relation between them is is entirely uh, internal, we might say. So uh, let's say let's say that uh, you are taller than me. I don't know if that's true, but let's say that you are taller than me. Um, well, that relation between us holds just in terms of uh, your height and my height, but the yeah. taller than relation doesn't exist necessarily in reality. So that, this way we can problematize either view really. So the relational ontology uh, are there just the relations or uh some sort of a substance ontology or property ontology are there just those things rather than the relations and um it's not easy to come up with a conclusive argument for either view in fact <laughs> yeah i guess that this in a sense goes back to something that we discussed earlier when i mentioned process ontology and how i've been talking about it over the past few months with psychologists neuroscientists mm. and so on because i mean again they still mention the substances there, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, even if you don't mention substances by name, it's difficult to get around the idea that there is, uh, there's something that sort of holds properties together or something that uh, the relations relate. Uh, yeah. So, uh, or, or something that survives through a process, you know, has identity over time, um, unless you look at the process in a more holistic way. Uh, holistic fashion so uh, yeah i think all of, all of these options are are on the table yeah M maybe we need more buddhists in science to help us deal with <laughs> with real with cashing things out in exclusively relational or process ontology terms and just doing away with substances <laughs> maybe it's a limitation of uh, our western culture i don't know <laughs> Well, you could be you could be right. Um, I mean, there are there are examples of process ontologists in Western Western culture as well, of course. But you may be yes. right that it's a, it's a more um, uh, sort of more well uh, researched topic uh, mm -hmm. outside that the uh, the Western uh, metaphysics, if you like. And I mean, yeah. and, and same goes actually for some of those uh, other topics that we mentioned: the sort of coherentist networks, mm -hmm. holistic views, and in indeed those infinite uh, networks as well. So, um, uh, so people in uh, studying fundamentality have have uh, uh, drawn inspiration from uh, from Eastern uh, philosophy for these for these topics as well. So, so perhaps we're thinking in reverse and it would be the highest levels that would be the fundamental. It would be actually culture that is the, the fundamental level of reality. And then you would derive all the rest from uh, that. <laughs> perhaps so, perhaps so. Uh, I don't know if that's still going to be realist. <laughs> well... <laughs> we would have to perhaps discuss that with other people as well and in another conversation. So, uh, Dr. Uh, or Thomas, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yeah, um, it'll, it'll be easy because my name is very unique if you can spell yeah. it right. Uh, so, so Google is your friend. But uh, my, my website is just uh, T-T-A-H-K-O dot net and uh all my papers are there but they're also on google scholar and phil papers uh, which is the archive for philosophical work that is very helpful um yeah okay great i'm leaving links to that in the description of the interview and thank you thank so you. much again for taking the time to come on the show it was really fun talking with you thanks very much ricardo likewise it was uh, it was uh, very entertaining Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com and also please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perergo Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinasi, Zub, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Gavana, 
Michael Stormir, Samuel André, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Fergal Cousin, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, João Linhares, Stanton T, Samuel Correia, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Leira, Tom Hamel, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correia, Yannick Puntara, Dan Rusman e Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevski, Nelek Bakka, Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, George Stéphanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles de Murray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Erringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracie, Zigoren, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Ignikir, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Alni Cortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all. <laughs>